Yeah, it's just wonderful. We had a fabulous time um, with a group that we got to spend a couple days with, and uh, now we get to spend the afternoon with you all. And please come up and hug and, and share your name. We, we enjoy that so much. And I want to say I love your house. As we travel, we get to experience different houses. You know from the moment you walk in what your house emulates, and you emulate love. You do. And your hospitality, I have to say, you have got an amazing pastor with Pastor Caleb and uh, Miss Marley. You guys, your hospitality is just wonderful. Thank you for the way that you shared and you loved and, and you just um, honored us over yesterday and today. Thank you so much. And Miriam, I don't know where you're at, but uh, that worship rocked. <laughs> Honey, Good job. Good job. if I can steal you, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> But thank she comes you. With the tables, man. That's what I thought. Yeah, <laughs> you said I could. But thank you for letting the Lord use you and Marley and your team. Yeah. You you guys really have it. And some other things that I've just noticed when I walked into the room, I love the communion. We're a big communion church because that's what it's about. Communion means communing, talking, fellowship with the Father. So the fact that you love to do communion, that so touches our heart. And I noticed the anointing oil. I love the fact that you keep it open and available and right up front for use. You guys are a phenomenal church. And Mama Lay, wow. You did communion so well at our table. Thank you for that. Communion is so dear to me. So sitting with you and doing communion at your table. You could just feel the heart and the love that you have for the Father. So thank you for being the, the mom at this house and for doing that at this table. So thank you so much for loving us and welcoming us. And I'm going to let him talk now because I'm going to blubber again. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I'll help you back. Super good. Everybody doing good? Yes. I'm pretty excited to be with you guys. It's pretty awesome. I, I, uh, Pastor Lori already kind of mentioned so many awesome things that we were able just to experience with you, but uh, man, I'm excited about chicken. <laughs> uh, I'm no, just kidding. Uh, but, but, I, but I do feel really good about just being with you guys and just being able to share. Uh, I've been kind of looking over some things that have been going on. I talked with Caleb a little bit yesterday and uh, had a couple of things on my heart, but what I've been watching is that over the last month, you guys have been talking about the Holy Spirit and the empowering that comes with that. And I really feel like one of the things that God's doing is raising up an empowered people. That it's not about a big name in a tent. It's about the, the nameless, faceless, but we're out in the mall. We're, we're, we're out, it's wherever we are because we carry the kingdom. Let, let me preface, and I'm, if it's okay, I'm going to kind of jump into things. I, I'd like to do the formalities, but it, it, time's going to get away from us. But in the midst of all that, as I look, uh, like you got the scriptures like in Matthew chapter 10, and Jesus says, when you come into a house, let your peace come upon it. You know, salute that. When you come into a house, salute the house, let your peace come upon it. And, and it's interesting that he didn't say, let his peace come upon it. He said, let your peace come upon it. Why? Because you're a carrier of it now. So what he said is, when you come into a house... You don't allow the atmosphere of the house to change you. You change the atmosphere of the house. How many understand we're called to change atmospheres because of the kingdom that we carry? What I want to talk to you about today is that I believe that everything you need to live and walk in victory has already been provided for by the blood of the Lamb. That you've been empowered to actually carry the kingdom and walk in victory in every situation. Uh, when I first... When I first got born again, I came out of Roman Catholicism. Uh, I came into an amazing group of people that loved Jesus and, and talked about salvation and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and I got pretty excited about it. And I read a scripture in 1 John 2 and 6, and it said, if we say that we abide in him, we also ought to walk even as he walked. And I thought that was impossible because I'm not God. Can, can I give you, boy, I'm, I don't want to mess with your theology too bad, but right off the jump street, let me tell you, in my world, this is what I believe. I believe that everything Jesus did, he did as a man in a right relationship with the Father, empowered by the Holy Spirit. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? Because if everything he did, he did as God, and then he says, follow me, I can't follow him, I'm not God. But if everything he does, he does as a man in a right relationship with the Father, empowered by the Holy Spirit, now I have a model that I can follow. Everybody tracking with me? So in the midst of that, let me, boy, I didn't plan any of this, but hang with me, okay? When, when, Jesus, when Jesus calls his disciples and he says, follow me, that's a pretty big deal. Now, if we're reading our Bible, but we don't have a full understanding of that, you find he comes up and there's James and John and there's Andrew and Philip and, 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 and Peter and all. And Jesus just simply says two words, follow me. Now, now watch, James and John leave Zebedee, their father. They leave a successful fishing business, and they just walk away from that. And you, re- you would look at that and think, that's kind of odd. And you might say, well, why, did they, why would they walk away from everything for an itinerant rabbi that they really don't even know? And you might say, well, the anointing that was on Jesus was so powerful. It really, and, and I love the thought of that, and I think that could be a, a portion of it. But the reality is, the words follow me meant something to those young men. Okay, listen to what this means, because every young boy that's in, Ju- in Judaism, they, when they were raised, from the time that they were six years old until they were 12 years old, they would actually go to a school. And I, 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 the name of the school escapes me, but from the time they were six until they were 12, they're in school. Okay, and what they're doing is they're learning, they're learning the Torah. They're learning the, the, the it's, we call, we'd call it the Pentateuch, the first five books of the law, right? So they're learning Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they're learning large portions of scriptures. They're committing them to memory. All this is going on during that time, they're, and they're learning. Then when they turn, when they're, when, they're, when they're at the end of being 12, they're about to turn 13. I mean, they're going to go through what's called a bar mitzvah, right? And, and they're, that's their entrance into manhood, if you would. Uh, He's, the rabbi who is over the school is going to take just a select handful of them, and they're actually going to be they're invited into the next school. The rest of them are going back to their fathers. If your father was a fisherman, you're going to learn to trade to fish. If their father was a carpenter, they're going to learn to trade to be a carpenter. If your father was a farmer, you're going to learn agriculture. Why? Because they would follow in the ways of their dad. Everybody follow that? So, but the ones that came a little bit farther, the very best in the class, they're going to actually be invited to go to the next school. And it's a three-year school from the time they're 12 until they're 15. And for those three years, they're going to learn the feast of Israel. They're going to learn the, the, uh, all, the, all the history of the Israel people. They're going to learn all the oral traditions, and they're going to learn all of that. And they're going to be poured into them. For three years, this rabbi is going to be very intentional about pouring into them. At the time of the end of that school, he's actually going to find the very best of all that class, and he's going to take off his tallit, his prayer shawl, if you would. He's going to put it around the neck of that young man in two words, follow me. Those two words, follow me, meant something to every young Jewish boy. What it meant was this. You can know what I know. You can do what I do. You can be just like me. Do you understand that follow me meant something? But that same follow me comes to you and I. Now, you might say, well, I don't know about all that. Watch this. you got a storm. you got a bunch of disciples in a boat. And here comes Jesus walking on the water. Am I right? Come on. That's a freaky day. I don't care who you are. (laughs) Okay? (laughs) Like, I'm anxious for that day. I want to go fishing on the Susquehanna. Excuse me, pardon me. I'm just going over here. Walk right down the river. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. Uh, but, but in the midst of that, Jesus is walking on the water. And, 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 and they're afraid. They think it's a ghost. Actually, the word would be a phantom if you follow that. It's a, it's a phantom if you follow it in the Greek. And then, and then Jesus says, don't be afraid. It's me. What's Peter say? Lord, if it's really you, bid me to come to you on the water. Why? Follow me. You can know what I know you can do. Peter only believed he could walk on the water because Jesus said, follow me. You can do what I do. Does everybody follow that? Can I talk to us and tell you that, man, we're called to actually do this. And you've been empowered to do it. So I'm going to take an Old Testament story, bring it into a New Testament revelation, and help you to see what's really in the story. Is that okay? Cool. Go with me to 1 Samuel 17. Everybody all right? As soon as I said 1 Samuel 17, a lot of you that are scholars know, wait a minute, that's David and Goliath. Exactly. Okay. So we're going to take that, but it might go a little deeper than what you're used to. So let's have fun with that. Is that all right? Uh, For the sake of time, I'll probably talk a lot of the story without reading a lot of it, if that's okay. Uh, But you can follow along. We're just going to kind of look at 1 Samuel 17. The only other place we're going to be is John 19. Okay. So here we go. Everybody all right? You got the Philistines, and they've been, they've been a, uh, an antagonist against the Israelite people for years. Uh, and, and, and oftentimes under an old covenant, please understand, 
all of history is divided into two covenants. You have an old covenant and a new covenant. Biblical history, what I would say. And what we're looking at is, from the time of Moses, the, the covenant is given to, Ab to Abraham. The law is given to Moses, if we can follow all this. But, but what we're looking at is that this old covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, everything that was under the law, it is on one side of the cross. The new covenant's on the other side of the cross. How many understand? We just did communion, and we sat at the table. Please understand this. At the table, if you look at it, whether it's Luke's gospel or Matthew's, you're going to find Jesus making a statement. This is the new covenant of my blood. This is the blood of the new covenant. If we have a covenant, we ought to know what's in that covenant. If God gave us a covenant, we ought to know what came with the covenant. I have a lot of friends who travel and they're really evangelistic at heart and they feel like, man, I'm just really called to the lost. I've not ever really felt that. From the time of the original calling on my life as a pastor, I felt like I was called to the found. Why? I, I want to let you know, <laughs> when you got born again, what came with the package? <sighs> when you stepped into this new covenant, what came into the covenant? Because it's so much more than just a ticket to heaven. It's so much more than just a get out of jail free card. <laughs> Come on. It's so much more than what we've allowed it to become. You know what I mean? It's not about, listen, when I first got born again and when I first started preaching, man, I was an escapist. Anybody know what I say when I say an escapist? Come on, man. Here's what I'm like. Like, pray this prayer. Get your name in the book. Because one of these days we're going to get out of this old garbage dump of a world and we're going to heaven. You know what I mean? And, and I, I want you to pray the prayer so you can go with me. And if you didn't pray the prayer, put you in the headlock. Pray the prayer. Pray the prayer. Because we're going. You know? It's like, come on, man. We're going to get out of here. You know? Why? Because it was all about escaping the world. How many know Jesus didn't come so you would escape the world? He came so you could change it. Come on. He's alive inside of you to make a change and a difference. And we have to live from that perspective. How are we changing the world? Does that make sense? Come on, man. Your yes meant something in heaven. It ought to mean something on the earth. Oh, that was a good quote right there. I just made that up. That's good. Okay. Go, go with me to 1 Samuel 17. I told you I'm going to try to conserve time, and I'm not doing very well. Okay. <laughs> So you got, you, got, you got the Philistines on one mountain. Let's just read, okay? The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side. Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. There's a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. Let me explain all that if I can. Okay, Israel and, 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 and the Philistines are about to go to battle, so the, the battle's going to be fought in the valley, but they're both on the mountainside. Does everybody follow that? It's going to be the Valley of Elah. But, but in the midst of that, what you got is they've set the battle in array, which simply means they came out with all their battle gear on, right? And, and now they're ready to fight, and, and, and what's happening is you got this guy comes out from the Philistines, and, and it's pretty huge, okay? He's a big dude. It, we read it in, in the New King James, it's six cubits in a span. A cubit was the length from your elbow to the top of your fingers. It was considered at the time to be about 18 inches. So we can read this and find out the guy's actually about nine foot nine inches tall. Is everybody all right with that? Like if you can picture a basketball hoop, he's just under it. Okay, he's just a pretty big dude, right? Uh, come on, that's a big dude, I don't care who you are. And, and his name is Goliath. And, and his name's Goliath, and he's from Gath, okay? That's important that you know where he's from. He's from Gath. Gath is one of the capital cities of the Philistines. They had 10 capital cities. So when you see like a, a territory called Decapolis, it's from two words, Deca and Capolis. Deca is 10, Capolis is capital. So there were 10 capital cities in the Philistines. Everybody all right with that? Right? So, but he's from Gath, and it's important. He's because his name is Goliath, and he's from Gath, and he's nine foot nine inches tall. But we can call it six cubits in a span. Got a bronze helmet, okay? A coat of mail is overlapping bronze plates, if you can follow that. 5,000 and shekels is about 126 pounds. Everybody okay? Right? He had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between uh, his shoulders. And the spear, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, right? Which is about 15 pounds. And a shield bearer went before him. Everybody got this? Okay? Now, can we talk a little bit? Well, let me read. Let me read. And he stood and he cried out to the armies of Israel and he said to them, Why have you come out to line up for the battle? Am I not a Philistine and you're the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, 
We'll be your servants, but if I prevail against him and kill him, you'll be our servants and you'll serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. And when Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Everybody got it? Okay, so let's get the scene. Everybody get the scene. Two armies on either side of the mountain. The giant comes down into the valley. He says, hey, choose you a man that he might come and fight with me. If I whoop him, you're our servants. If he whoops me, then you, you, we'll be your servants. But I defy the armies of Israel. Choose you a man that we might come and fight together. But you got this dude that's nine foot nine. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not wanting to fight this guy. <laughs> right? And Saul and everybody in the army is like freaking out. Like who could take this dude out? Because he's huge. And in the midst of all that, what they're looking at is they're, they're, they're seeing seeing his outward stature, they're seeing everything about him. But here's the deal. If you look at Goliath, and you'll find he was six cubits in a span, he had six pieces of armor, and his spearhead weighed six shekels of iron, 600 shekels of iron, right? 666, remind you of anything. Come on, Goliath represents everything that hell could throw at the children of God. There's fear. There's intimidation. It's all about, he is representing everything that hell is going to bring against the people of God. And we start to look at that from that perspective, and we see that. Everybody got it? Okay. So what happens is you got David, and he's, David has, has already, can we talk a minute? David's already been anointed by Samuel. Okay. It's important that you understand that. And he's already playing harp in the palace for Saul, because Saul's troubled because he's going insane. I'll just leave that alone. But in the midst of all that, uh, and David would come and play, and that would soothe him, but he would go back and forth from Jesse's house to the castle, and Jesse's house in the castle. At this point, he's back at Jesse's house. Everybody got that? And this is going on. But it's not just going on once or twice. Drop down to about verse 16. The Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. Everybody see it? So what's that? 80 times. This has already gone on 80 times. Everybody get this? Okay, so this is going on and on and on. And, and can I say this? Every time they see the giant, more intimidation's coming on them. We don't have anybody that can take this guy. What's, what are we gonna do? And now fear, and, and how many know the more you meditate on fear, the bigger fear becomes? Boy, there's a whole sermon right there. I don't have time for that, okay? But, but in the meantime, it's just building in them, all right? So look at verse 17, because this is where it gets kind of neat. Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah, this dried grain, that's about a, a bushel, right, of dried grain, and these ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp. And carry these ten cheeses to the captain of the thousand, and see how your brothers fare, and bring back news of them. Now Saul and all, they of the, and, and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Everybody see it? Let me ask you a question. How's David end up on the battlefield? Can I show you a prophetic picture? The father sent the son who would take out the intimidator of the children of God. Come on, man. The father sent the son to take out the intimidator. Can we go here? Because why? A thousand years later, the father would send the son. What's his title? Son of David. Come on. The father sent David to take out Goliath. The father sent the son of David to take out everything that Goliath stood for. <laughs> There's a prophetic picture in this whole thing. It goes on. It gets really cool, right? So David goes, and, and, he, and boy, I won't take a whole lot of time, but he goes, he shows up on the battlefield. Can we talk a little bit? Let's go. Uh, 22, 20, yeah, 22. David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper. He ran to the army. He came and greeted his brothers. And as he talked with them, there, uh, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him, and they were dreadfully afraid. Everybody got this? David shows up, and for the first time, he actually hears Goliath. And what's Goliath say? Choose you a man that we might come and fight together. If he beats me, we'll be your servants, but if I beat him, you'll be our servants. I defy the armies of Israel. Choose you a man that we might come and fight together. Everybody runs and everybody's afraid, and David's standing there saying, what the world's going on? Here's where it gets important, right? Look at verse, uh, the, the, next, the next verse, verse 25, right? So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he's come up to defy Israel. And it'll be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Right? How cool is that? 
What did he say? He said, you beat this giant, you'll be enriched with great riches, you married a king's daughter, your father's house free from tax. I'm thinking I would do it for the tax. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Y'all figure that out, right? But, 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 but something happens in this moment. And I can show you why I know that happens because it's going to be repeated over and over. David actually heard something and a light started to come on. You'd be enriched with great riches. You'd marry the king's daughter and your father's house would be free from tax. Okay? Let me show you a couple verses and then we'll talk about it because it gets important. Watch this. Okay? And David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy the armies of the living God? Everybody see it? And then the people answered him again in the same manner, right? The second time. What's he hear? What's he hearing? You'll be enriched with great riches, marry the king's daughter, and your father's house will be free from tax. What I want you to understand is this. David had been anointed by Samuel. Who knows that's true, right? What happens? Samuel shows up at Jesse's house in Bethlehem, right? And Jesse brings all the boys in, and seven of them pass by. But there's no king to be found. And you got Abinadab, and you got Eliab, and you got Shammah, and you got all these guys. And, and, and there's no king to be found. And, and Samuel's like, it's not any of them. Do you have any more boys? And what Jesse say? I got one little boy. He's out in the backfield. Everybody know this? Come on, he's out in the backfield. When David come in, can I tell you something about David? David was number eight. Why? There was an anointing on number eight. Number, the number eight stands for new beginnings. I, I, I felt like whenever I was even thinking about this morning, I thought, you know what? Today's a day of new beginnings for somebody in the house. Uh, today's a day that somebody's going to say, you know what? The anointing of God is on my life. Today's a day of new beginnings. Today's a day of fresh starts. I don't have to go out of here the way I came in here. Sometimes you just got to get determined. You know what? I'm going to see change. In the midst of that, David heard something. When David got anointed to be king, he knew Samuel was the man of God. He knew Samuel had anointed him to be king. Here's a problem. To become a king in David's generation, there's only a couple ways you became a king. You either had a military overthrow and you overthrew the sitting king, right? But to do that, you've got to be a man of influence and power. David's not a man of influence. He's a man. He's a shepherd. And he's the low shepherd on the totem pole, if you would. Is that okay to say it that way? And you guys know what I'm talking about. He doesn't have have influence. He doesn't have military power. He doesn't have any might. How's he going to overthrow the sitting king? The only other way would be what? That you, by by succession, you're in the king's family. And if, 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 and and rich with great riches is awesome. But what did he say next? Marry the king's daughter. If I marry the king's daughter, that sets me up for the prophetic promise that's been set on my life. And all I got to do to step into that prophetic promise is kill this giant. Anybody hear what I just said? (laughs) David, David goes on the battlefield because he had a prophetic promise that was spoken over his life. Uh, Paul told Timothy, war a good warfare by the prophecies that have been spoken over your life. Come on, sometimes you got to know, I can take out a giant. Why? Because there's a prophetic promise on my life. uh, Oh, that I'm not going to be what I used to be. I'm not going to be like I used to be. I could start to get excited. I don't know. (laughs) But some of this stuff really grabs my heart. And I see the prophetic promise that was spoken over his life. David goes on the battlefield. Not be, listen, the only reason he believes, there's two things that just happened right here. David said something else. He said, who is this uncircumcised? Why? Because circumcision was the sign of covenant to the Jewish people. And David said, wait a minute. <laughs> That's a giant. But he got no covenant. And David was smart enough to know a shepherd with a covenant is better than a giant without one. Come on. Sometimes you've got to know, if David had a covenant, can I tell you something about you? you got a better covenant. <laughs> the new covenant is a better covenant. If it's a better covenant, that means i got all the promises of the old covenant and more. <laughs> That's what makes it better. If I don't have all those promises, it might not be better, but it's better because I get everything from the old covenant plus more. That's pretty awesome. So David's like, dude, this is going to be awesome. This this guy's going down. He got a plan. I like it. And the people answered him in the same manner, saying, so shall it be done. That's verse 27, right? Second time he heard the promise, right? Now watch. 
Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, Eliab's anger is aroused against David, and he said, Why'd you come down here? And who'd you leave your few sheep with in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart. You just come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Eliab's kind of blowing off his little brother. What are you doing here, runt? Well, who'd you leave them few sheep with? Go home. You just came out here to see the battle. And David's like, dude, you don't even understand. Can I talk to you? Don't allow what they can't see to keep you from walking in what you can see. Whew. Come on. Sometimes there'll be people that'll rise up against you and try to take out your anointing and make you think less of yourself. But I'm going to tell you something. When, when God's on the move in your life, don't let somebody talk you out of what God's talking you into. Because God will talk you into stuff, but you've got to be in partnership with heaven. And sometimes, even our own family sometimes doesn't understand the call of God on our life. Oh, I, man, I could spend an hour there, but I, got, I only got about another two hours to preach. So stay with me. Stay with me. Sorry. Okay. I, I just like this stuff. It's really important. So, so, so watch. He says, is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And then the people answered him at the first one's death. What? What shall be done? You're being rich with great riches. Married. Come on. It's the third time. You know what I believe David was happening? What's happening? David was getting a vision of the reward. He could see himself in rich with great riches, marrying the king's daughter. Come on. He could see himself in line for that prophetic promise to be fulfilled. In his. Sometimes you've got to get a vision of your future that will get you through your present. Come on. Sometimes you need a vision of your future to get you through your present circumstances. Sometimes you've got to know, wait a minute, it might be bumpy now, but there's a day coming. Come on, sometimes you've got to just determine, you know what, it might have been challenging, but you know what, I'm going to come through this fire. Every time you come through the fire, you've got one of two choices. You can come out better or bitter. Come on. I used to find myself in the fire. I'd be like, God, get me out of this fire. Get me out of this fire. And now I don't pray that way anymore. I say, God, teach me what i got to learn while I'm in this fire so I can come out better and stronger and I don't have to repeat it. Come on. Because if I don't learn what I have to learn while I'm in the fire, I'll end up back in that fire again. Come on. A lesson that's not learned will be repeated. How do you know that? Sixth grade was the best three years of my life. Okay. So, come on, man. Uh, that's really not true, but anyway. You with me? Come on. So let me tell you what goes on. David's like, I'll fight that giant. And, and, and the people came and told Saul, there's a guy ready to fight the giant. What's his name? His name's David. So watch what happens. Uh, uh, 33, just to save time, right? Okay. Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You're a youth, and he's a man of war from his youth. Can we talk? Let me read. David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came near, he took a lamb out of the flock. I went out after it and I struck it and delivered it, delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and I struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he's defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the bear and delivered me from the paw of the lion, right? He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Wow! Sometimes you just got to know the battle's not yours, it's God's. That only comes from a surrendered life. But David understood the call that was on his life. He understood the prophetic promises. He understood how big his God was. Saul's looking at David and he's like, David, you can't kill that giant. He's too big to kill. And David's like, dude, that giant's too big to miss. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to see it through the right perspective, man. Come on. Let me tell you what happens. Saul takes his armor and puts it on David. And David's like, can, can, can I tell you why? If Saul's the king, he's got the best armor in town. Ain't nobody got better armor than the king. If you're sending your king out to battle, you're putting the very best armor on him. Why? You're going to protect him. So like, if you're going to go fight this giant, you ought to at least wear my armor. And so he puts on Saul's armor, but you have to remember something. Why was Saul chosen to be king? Because he was the biggest dude in the camp, right? Come on. The scripture actually says he was head and shoulders above all the rest. And that wasn't like a dandruff commercial. 
is about his stature. And so, 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 he, so he's, he's got them together, and, and, and they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna work with him. And, and, and he puts this armor on, and David's like, dude, I can't wear this. Remember that David is small, and Saul's large. Imagine a little guy, come on, in this great big armor trying to move, you know? It's just not going to happen. It's not going to fly well. So in the midst of all that, he's like, I can't even wear this, but I want to show you what he did do, because I feel like preaching right now. Verse 40. David took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and he put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and his sling was in his hand and he drew near this Philistine. He goes down to the brook in the valley of Elah. Can I talk to you? Every word in your Bible means something. It's not there by accident. There's nothing in your Bible that's coincidental. He picked up five smooth stones. I think that's huge. Why does he take five? Is he afraid he might miss with the first couple? I don't think so. Can I tell you what the real truth of it is? He took a stone for Goliath. But if you know this, Goliath has four brothers that are all giants. Well, I know that because David's mighty men killed them over in 2 Samuel 23, right? 2 Samuel 21, I'm sorry. And he kills all of uh, David's mighty men are going to kill the other four brothers. I actually believe he grabbed one stone for, for Goliath, and he thought if your brothers are behind them, behind them mountains over there, i got a rock in my pocket for every one of them. Come on. So sometimes you just got to know there's a rock in your pocket, and giants are about to fall. And you got to know, listen, the same God that's able to take out Goliath can take out all of Goliath's brothers in the same face. Uh, and there's something about understanding. David was confident, but he didn't just pick stones. He picked every word is important. He picked out five smooth stones. Why does he pick out smooth stones? Uh, because a smooth stone will fly aerodynamically correct. Can we talk? Uh, come on. Who's ever got on a plane? You know what? They make a plane a certain way. Why? So it'll fly aerodynamically. You're not going to get on a plane that has about 19 wings sticking out in every direction. Because then you'd be going down the road like, yes, ouch. And it's just not going to go very well. Why? Because they make it so it's aerodynamically correct. David said, I'm going to get the stones that are smooth. And, and I want to ask you a question. What made them smooth? Pressure. Oh, I just preached. Come on. They'd been under pressure for a long season. But during that time that they were under pressure, they were being prepared for a purpose. Oh, I feel like preaching now. See, sometimes when we're walking through pressure, we don't understand that that pressure wasn't meant to destroy you. It was meant to prepare you. The pressure that you were facing was preparing you for your destiny. These rocks had a destiny. And you know what? There was something about the pressure that was preparing them for purpose. The pressure that you might be under today it might be the purpose of your destiny tomorrow. And you just got to come through it. But God was preparing those stones over the years of pressure, getting them ready. So David, David's ready to go to battle. And they come together, and boy, I'm going to watch my time, but the Philistine's like, dude, who are you? I'm going to spit you up and chew you out and throw you out to the birds. And David looked at him. Let me tell you what David said. 45, David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you've defied. And this day the Lord's going to deliver you into my hand and I'll strike you and I'll take your head from you. And this day I'll give the carcass of the camp of the Philistines to the birds. Come on, I love this. To the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel. And all this army shall know that the Lord doesn't save with sword and spear for the battles the Lord's and he's going to give you into our hands. <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. Can I talk to you about the confidence that was in David? David didn't have confidence in his skill. He had confidence in his God. Whew. I've had people talk to me and said, you're kind of arrogant. No, I'm just confident. There's a line between arrogance and confidence. I know who my God is. Whew. I know who I am. If you don't know who you are, you'll spend the rest of your life letting somebody else tell you who you are. Your identity means everything. David knew who he belonged to. God's going to deliver you. And you're going down, giant. <laughs> Woo, I, I feel like preaching, but... Oh. So they ran at each other, right? 
Verse 49, David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine in the forehead. And the stone sank in his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. And David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, struck the Philistine, and killed him. But there wasn't a sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of his sheath, and killed him, and cut off his head with it. <laughs> I like it. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Right? That's pretty awesome. Yay, God. Yeah. He, he didn't just kill him. He then took his own sword. He took Goliath's sword. I, come on. If you're nine foot nine, you've got a big old sword. I don't care who you are. Right? And, and he grabbed that big old sword and he cut off his head. And I thought, that's awesome. He cut his head off. Whew. Why is that awesome? Because where was the intimidation coming from? He cut off the voice of the enemy. Sometimes you've got to just cut off the voice of the enemy. Do not go home and kill anybody. That's not what I meant. Okay. <laughs> People are not your enemy. We ain't wrestling flesh and blood, Ephesians 6 and 12. Come on. <laughs> but in the place of that, what I want you to understand, this is the really important part. He cut off his head. That's pretty awesome. Let's take a deeper look, because what happens next is what's really important. I want you to see this. This is where your victory really comes, Right? Verse 54, David took the head of the Philistine and he brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. What happened? David took the head of the Philistine to Jerusalem. Now, we don't have the whole story here, so we have to understand history and culture. Is that okay? Because I've studied this, I understand history and culture. It wouldn't be unusual, okay, if, if, uh, if two people went to war together, okay, two kings go to war, Right? So let's say I'm a king and Caleb's a king. We'll just use that. And, and, and I prevail. My army prevails over Caleb's army and we win. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to cut off Caleb's head. I'm going to put it on a pole, if you would, a stick. I'm going to hold it up in the air. And the army's coming with me, and we're going to march back to our home city. And when we do, the people, there's all, every city's walled, and on the walls they have lookouts, scouts, if you would. They see us coming, the head of our enemies there. All the city's going to run out and join us, and we're going to celebrate. And that head on the stick really means that God has delivered the enemy into our hand. Does everybody understand that? So David is now coming to Jerusalem with the head of Goliath on a stick. Listen, if you're nine foot nine, you got a big old head. <laughs> it's, a, it's like bigger than two basketball heads, you know what I mean? Come on, it's a big old head. And David's probably like, whoa, <laughs> we got this, you know. And, but but there's, it's going to be a parade because, listen, remember that we said for 40 days they were standing in fear and intimidation and all the stuff that was going on. That, and now all that's gone and we're victorious and they're going to be our slaves and they're routing them and they're actually taking the spoils of war. It's a pretty awesome day for Israel. Right? And there's celebration and they're shouting and they're throwing confetti and tossing babies in the air and pulling their hair out. It's an awesome day. Right? They're excited. And then that's the end of the story. We don't have the rest of the story, so we have to come back again to culture and understanding. Where are they at? They're in Jerusalem. They're in Jerusalem. David's killed. Goliath, champion of Gath, is dead. Right? And they have this celebration. Understand this, even today in the Middle East, in a lot of cultures in the Middle East, if you die, 24 hours you've got to be in the ground. Everybody know this? You've got 24 hours to get him in the ground. Remember that Jesus misses Lazarus' funeral? Why? Because after he died, they have 24 hours to get him buried. Why? Because he's considered unclean. Right? They're going to get him in the ground. Now remember that all the cities were walled, okay? So they're going to have to, they got the head of Goliath in the city. Guess what? They're going to have to bury that thing. I got 24 hours to get it in the ground, right? Now, do you bury it inside the city or outside the city? You can't bury it inside the city because it's considered unclean. Nothing unclean could be buried inside the city, so they have to go outside the city, and they're going to bury his head. Everybody follow what I just said? Go to John 19. Because a thousand years later, the son of David. Can we talk? I got a couple minutes. I'm going to take it. They arrest Jesus in the garden. Am I right? You guys know the story. I love the idea Peter's going to defend him, right? We've got this story where he cuts off Malchus's ear, right? Here's what I can tell you. There's no way that Peter cuts off Malchus's ear like this and cut his ear off. Peter was swinging this way, tried to cut off his head. Malchus stuck. All he got was the ear. Jesus picks the ear up and puts it back on. 
I'm wishing Malchus wouldn't have ducked. I want to see Jesus pick up the head and put it back on. I think that, I think that would have been really cool. <laughs> like, I want to see the chosen do that one. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. But, 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 but in the middle of that, I, they take Jesus away. Uh, and, and what happens? There's all these trials are going on. And then who shows up? Mrs. Pilate shows up. And she talks to Pilate and she says, Pontius, have nothing to do with the blood of this just man. I've been troubled by a lot of dreams. And Pilate goes, "Uh uh-oh, mama ain't happy. And if mama ain't happy, (laughs) all the men are like, no, no, (laughs) no. In the midst of that, what happens? Pilate goes down into the the prison to find the worst criminal he can find. He goes down into the lower prison. He finds a guy who's committed murder and started a bunch of riots. If, when you read in your King James or New King James, guilty of sedition, it literally means he started a bunch of riots, okay? So this guy starts riots and kills people, and he's really a bad hombre. Um, what was his name? Yeah, Barabbas. Here's why that's important, okay? Names meant something in the Bible. When you go back to biblical times, names were always very, very significant. The prefix B-A-R always meant son of, okay? Like Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon son of Jonah or son of John. Everybody got that? Right? And, and you got like Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, which Timaeus was the Greek form of Timothy. Everybody got that? Bartimaeus, Barabbas. Wait a minute, Barabbas. Abbas is a derivative of Abba. So Barabbas is a son of the father who is guilty and sentenced to die. But the father's only begotten son stepped up and took his place so the sons of the father could go free. Do you you understand that Bartimaeus is a prototype of every one of us? Why? We were all guilty and sentenced to die. But the Son, come on, the only begotten Son took our place so that we could have true freedom. How cool is that? (laughs) You understand what I'm saying? In the midst of that, Pilate's trying to get rid of Jesus. Which one can we set free? Free Barabbas. What do you want me to do with Jesus? What'd they say? Crucify him. Crucify him. Pick it up in John chapter 19, verse 16. Then they delivered him to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. I would propose to you that Golgotha was not named because it looked like something on the exterior. I believe it's called the place of a skull because the head of Goliath of Gath was buried there. Why do you say that, Pastor Don? I want to walk with you through this. Why? Remember that I said Goliath represented everything that hell could throw at us. And David takes Goliath out. (laughs) But a thousand years later, the son of David would now shed his blood to cover everything that hell could possibly throw at you. Come on. Why? So that you can live and walk in victory every day of your life because the blood of Jesus is more than enough for you to live and walk in victory over every circumstance, every situation, everything that hell can throw at you. I want you to know the blood has given you authority and power to walk in victory. I hope you're tracking with me. Why? Because I believe this, man. I believe this gospel. I believe you don't have to live up and down, up and down every day of your life. I believe you can live and walk in victory on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and all day Sunday. (laughs) We can do this, man. We're called to walk in righteousness. We were singing about freedom, and I heard the Lord speak really clearly. True freedom only comes with true righteousness. Because if you're not walking in righteousness, you're still bound. But you have the authority, the empowerment to walk. I I, I know what we're establishing in this house. It's an empowerment culture that people would walk in, in true power and true authority. Luke 10 and 19 is one of my favorite scriptures. He said, behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. What's he saying? The word power there, the first word of power is exousia. It means authority. You have authority over hell. That's a pretty big deal. Let me close with one quick story. 
I, when, I was, when I was young, I, I was a boxer for uh, uh, the Butler Cubs. It's the town I grew up in. But I was a boxer, and I worked out at the, at, the, at the YMCA all the time. And there was a guy there, and his name was Coyle, and he was this huge dude, man. Like at the waist, he was like this, and at the shoulders, he was like this. He looked like, a, a, like an oak tree with legs or something. I don't know. But <laughs> huge dude, man. And, and, and he would lift free weights all the time. And it, he, he was an Olympic bench presser. So he, he's punching out 400-pound lifts and stuff. And it's a deadlift and like 500 pounds and huge guy. I mean, his muscles had muscles. He, was, he scared me. <laughs> and, and, and super guy. And, and back then, I wasn't born again. And, but but he, was, he would come in, and he'd hand out tracks. Anybody remember the tracks, the little leaflets? You know what I mean? He would hand out tracks all the time. And he'd say, here, take one. I'd say, yes, sir, just don't hit me. <laughs> like, I'll take anything you want to have me. <laughs> just please don't hit me. Okay. And in the, in the midst of that super nice guy, comes in one day, and he's slamming the locker door. He was always a gentle giant. He slammed the locker door, and I thought, whoa, he ain't happy. And, and he goes over, and he's usually pretty gentle with his weights, and he's lifting weights and dropping them on the mats, and the whole room is shaking. Because when you drop that big of weights, the whole room shakes. And I'm like, dude, stop. and we're talking. We're like, something's up with Coyle, man. He ain't very happy. Something's going on. And, and, and after a little while, he seemed to calm down, and I knew him pretty good, and I walked over. I said, buddy, you doing okay? And he talks about, he, the guy drove, the guy's huge, right? He's like six foot two, muscles on his muscles. He drove a Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> You can't even make this stuff up. I mean, you know, but, but he's coming down. Uh, the highway was called 422 near our house. He's coming down the highway. And he said, this little girl, he said, I look in the mirror and the lights are on behind me. So I pull over and let the, let the cop by. And they're pulling me over. And he said, this little girl, he rolls down his window. And he says, this little woman cop, this little girl cop, she's about five foot two, maybe 100 pounds soaking wet, is coming there. And she said, you know why I pulled you over? And she said, he said, she's sticking her finger in my face. Telling me I was speeding. I didn't even know I was speeding. But her attitude. And he said, I thought, man, I could pick her up and throw her over the hill. And it would take four days for anybody to find her. <laughs> but he's squirming in his seat. Now, this guy, six foot two, with muscles on his muscles, is squirming because of a little girl that's five foot tall, right? And 100 pounds soaking wet. How does she make that big man? Because she had authority. Why? She's been authorized and deputized. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I want to talk to somebody. Can I tell you? You've been authorized and deputized. <laughs> You've got authority over all the power of the enemy. You should never be afraid of hell. Hell ought to be afraid of you. Uh, when, when you walk into a room, demons ought to be like, uh-oh, he's here. Uh-oh, she came in the room. Come on, why? Because you've got authority. You've got power. You've got the Holy Ghost living inside of you. Come on, church. We know who we are and what we have. And we shouldn't be afraid to walk in it. Stand with me all over the room. Is that okay? I didn't ask you how you normally end these things, but if there's a piano player, we'll do that. Is that okay? Or we can bring the whole worship team. I don't know what you usually do. Yeah. Here's what I can tell you. You got power. You got authority. Somebody told me a long time ago, they said, Pastor, if you start preaching like this all the time, man, the devil's going to get after you. I said, good, it'll make it easier to find him. <laughs> I actually believe this gospel. I actually believe we have authority. I actually believe that Jesus lives inside of me. When I got saved, I was really skinny. And I invited Jesus in. And when he came, he told me he brought the Father with him. He said, I and the Father will come. We'll make our home in you. And then he said, the Holy Spirit will be with you and he'll be in you. And I thought, the Father's in me, the Son's in me, the Holy Ghost is in me. I need to give them room. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt like it was the right thing to do. <laughs> if it's not, don't tell me I'm having fun. <laughs> Here's the reality. Do you understand? You're a powerhouse for the gospel. And I, I, I want to tell you something else, man. You need to know this. It ain't about longevity. I, I want you to have an incredible long run with God. I want you to build a history with God. But I can tell you this, man. If you've been saved two weeks, the same Jesus that's in me is in you. You, 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 you don't have less of Jesus. You, you might not have the same history. I got 45 years in this thing. 
But I'll tell you what, I, what, you have the same Jesus in you that I got in me. You have the same authority in you that I have in me. It matters. If the Holy Spirit's living inside of you, listen, you, you, didn't, you don't start out with a junior Holy Ghost. <laughs> you know them kids over in children's church? They get filled with the Holy Ghost, man. You go to Burger King, you can get a Whopper Junior, but you can't get a Holy Ghost Junior. You get the same deal. It's the same thing. It's the real deal inside of you. So I want to ask you, man. One of the prayers that I've been praying for a lot of years, Lord, I want to be an open gate of heaven. That heaven would flow through me. That it's not a Sunday morning deal. Heaven's flowing through me in the coffee shop. Lori and I have prayed for waitresses all over the country. It's fun to make a waitress cry <laughs> in a good way. If you're going to pray for them, tip them really well. Don't make us look bad. <laughs> but it does matter. Why? Because you can pray for waitresses. And you can pray for your bus driver. You, you can pray in school. I heard a thing they were trying to take prayer out of school. I said, not as long as they have tests. <laughs> they have tests. There's going to be prayer in school. Oh, God, I didn't study, but you can help me. <laughs> Come on, it's true. Can I tell you what Paul said? Christ in you, the hope of glory. What's the hope of glory? That you'd actually let him out. Whew. That he would flow through you. That you would be an open gate of heaven. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you this morning that your heart would be so open. But I'm gonna challenge you, is that okay? I wanna challenge you. I wanna challenge you that this week, if you pray this prayer with me, God, I wanna be an open gate of heaven. I want you to flow through me. When the opportunity comes, you'll actually let them flow. See, he said these signs would follow them that would believe, Mark 16. He didn't say these signs would follow them with a license hanging on the wall. He didn't say these signs would follow them that are ordained. He said these signs would follow believers. What? He'd actually lay your hands on the sick. And when you do, he'd back it up and they'd recover. If you're saying, Lord, make me an open gate of heaven, then somebody standing in front of you said, man, my back's killing me. Here's your sign. <laughs> you didn't get a word of knowledge. You got a hint of knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Somebody gets up and grabs their knee. Oh, there's your opportunity to pray for them right there. It's amazing what God will do if we say, Lord, make me an open gate of heaven. Why? Everything you need to live and walk in victory has been provided for by the blood of the Lamb. And you're called to be an open gate and let heaven flow through you, touch the world around you. If you're ready, I'm going to pray for you right now. And all you need to do is just say, God, I receive that. I want to be an open gate of heaven. Because if you ask him, he's going to give you opportunity. And if you ask him for opportunities and you don't take it, well, that's between you and him then. <laughs> Father, I just thank you for this house. I thank you, God, for the people that are gathered together here. I speak life and blessing and favor over each one. I thank you, Lord, that the gospel is real, it's true, it's vibrant and alive. I thank you that the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And God, you're doing a work in our hearts right now because we have a desire in the house to be an open gate of heaven, to let heaven flow through us to touch the world around us. God, that everything that we need to live and walk in victory has been provided for by the blood of the Lamb. And you've called us, Lord, to be ambassadors of your kingdom on the earth. And we have this ambassadorial privilege that says, as an ambassador, the kingdom that we represent will back us up on the earth. So God, I'm asking, back us up, Lord. Give us privilege. Give us opportunity. I want to be an open gate of heaven, Lord. And when we lay our hands on the sick, we're going to see him recover. We're going to speak words of life and blessing and favor and goodness. And we're going to see the favor of God moving upon the people of God. So, Lord, we just declare your goodness and your grace. And we ask, Lord, use us to put your goodness on display in this community. God, that people would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. God, that we would actually represent heaven right here on the earth. And, God, that you would flow through us. Holy Spirit, flow, touch, move, anoint, and let heaven move 
move in such a way that our lives are going from glory to glory, from glory to glory, and from glory to glory. That we go from faith to faith, that we go from strength to strength, that we go from glory to glory and see your glory manifested in this house. Holy Spirit, thank you for heaven's touch becoming more real to each one of us. We receive it today in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Thanks for letting me come and hang out.